Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Andres Quintanilla. I serve as a research analyst here at the Institute for Higher Education Policy. I want to welcome you all to our Degrees Review Community of Practice webinar. Today's topic is focused on communicating with adult learners and stopped out students during and after the pandemic. The webinar is part of a series of webinars that I have hosted to our Degrees Review Network. Typically, this is a resource hosted for that smaller audience. But because of the nature of today's topic, we wanted to share this with a much broader audience. We're going to kick off today's conversation with an overview of degrees when due, and then we'll hear about how this work was implemented in Michigan statewide. And following that, we'll hear from our colleagues at Kellogg Community College, who will discuss their roles in creating communication and re-engagement strategies. In the end, we'll also offer some time to our audience for you all to ask questions to our presenters. As with most webinars, you can find the chat or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Please feel free to ask questions throughout today's presentation. And again, we'll be addressing them towards the end of the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded for our degrees and institutions. You'll be able to find the recording in our learning management system. Um, and for all others that have registered for today's, events will also be following up with some information on access to the recording. Uh, so to get us started, I'd like to introduce today's first two speakers. From I have Leanne Davis, the Associate Director for Research and Policy, handles projects and research focus on post-secondary post degree completion, including I have degrees review initiative. As part of this nationwide project team, we engage adult learners and promote degree reclamation. Leanne develops learning experiences for practitioners to apply IHEP's research in practice and conducts, conducts research focus on post-secondary completion. This includes state policy and funding for post-secondary education, equity in post-secondary access and completion, and innovative programs that support students from historically underrepresented populations. Leanne's going to provide us with an overview of our National Equity and Completion Initiative degrees when due, and then she'll hand it off to Erica Orians who serves as the executive director of the Michigan Center for Student Success, which is part of the Michigan Community College Association. Prior to this role, she served as a senior research associate in the Utah Education Policy Center at the University of Utah. Eric has also held positions in student affairs and academic advising at the Ohio State University, Miami University Middletown campus, and Columbus College of Arts and Design. For degrees when due, Erica serves as the state liaison for Michigan, where she plays a key role in sharing best practices and guidance to institutions in Michigan that are part of this degrees when due initiative. Erica will discuss Michigan's involvement in degrees when due, and then she'll introduce our colleagues from the Kellogg Community College, Eric Green and Nikki Jewell. We'll talk about strategies for outreach during and after the, the pandemic. So with all that being said, I'd like to turn this presentation now over to Leanne. Great, thank you, Andres. And thank you so much, everyone who has made the time to join us today. Uh, as Andres mentioned a few moments ago, this webinar is part of a series that we normally offer to our Degrees When Due participating institutions. Uh, but because this topic, uh, we felt like it was so relevant to so many institutions and what so many of, of us are kind of dealing with in higher ed today. Um, and because we also wanted to be able to share some of the great work that our partner institutions are doing, we decided to open this up to um, a wide audience. Um, so I'm going to talk for just a couple moments about what is Degrees When Due in case you're new to this. Uh, Degrees When Due is an equity-based completion in initiative that is housed at the Institute for Higher Education Policy in Washington, DC. Uh, we are in our third year of implementation. And on, when I move to the next slide, I'll cover some of the types of institutions we've been working with and where those institutions are. Um, but the goal of Degrees When Due is to help increase degree attainment among the population of students with some college no degree. We are also working with our institutions to help them build capacity to implement degree reclamation strategies and to identify policies and practices that might be causing barriers for students to complete in the first place um, and help them understand what those barriers are, collect the data to show that these are indeed barriers for students and then 
use that to help remove those barriers as they then re-engage students to come back to their institutions and complete their degrees. We do this by offering step-by-step -step implementation guidance. We provide coaching to our institutions. We have a series of you know, subject matter expert webinars that we offer. Uh, we also host a community of practice. And in some of our states, we're doing a deep dive into institutional data and helping institutions to understand and start the conversation around who are the students that have stopped out from their institution and how might they, what might change um, if they're able to really target some of their efforts to re-engage those, those students who might be stopping out at higher rates than others. Um, I think it's, you know, among, I say beyond this, it's not just an initiative. We also have a really robust research agenda. Um, and so we're excited to start sharing some of those findings um, later this year and into early 2022, because we're really understanding who are students with some college and no degree, which students are experiencing barriers and what types of barriers are those? Um, are they academic barriers? Are they non-academic barriers? Is there a particular course requirement that is prohibiting a number of students from graduating? Or how many students might have financial holds on their records that are preventing them from being able to graduate or from being able to re-enroll and complete their degree? Um, but also how does focusing on this population help close equity gaps in attainment at the institutional level at the state level, and as we look at this on a national level as well. Next slide. To date, we have worked with over 190 participating campuses and systems. We've worked in 23 different states and systems. Um, and so far, 59 of those have been minority serving institutions. Um, and I'd like to highlight too that we did have a special webinar series where we were really focusing on um, how the minority serving institutions that we're working with are really working to implement these types of strategies for their students and what are, what are lessons that they have to share for other institutions that might be trying to close equity gaps in attainment. Uh, we're really, really excited. Um, I'm really excited to turn this over to Erica Oriens, one of our great partners in Michigan. Um, they, we have a long history of, of working with the Michigan Student Success Center and they kind of worked in some of our previous initiatives. Um, we had a number of institutions from Michigan in our first cohort of Degrees when due, um, and also in our second cohort, which we're going to share that work with you today. But I'd like to turn it over to Erica. Great, thank you, Leanne. Um, it's nice to see all of you today. Um, as Leanne said, my name is Erica Oriens and I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Center for Student Success at the Michigan Community College Association. And we represent the 20 uh, public state supported community colleges in the state of Michigan, including Kellogg Community College. Um, I, when I was thinking about um, introducing my, my great colleagues from KCC today, I was thinking back on about 20 years ago in 2001, I started an advising position in a college in Ohio and I took on a little project uh, to review degree audits and find students who may have already earned a degree or uh, may be close to earning a degree. And it was just kind of a side project I did while I was advising. Um, but and, and, and you know what, I found students, I actually found a lot of students, and it was a highlight of uh, my week when I got the chance to call students and tell them that they might be eligible for a degree. Um, so my uh, sort of experience with Degrees When Due started actually down in Ohio about 20 years ago. Um, but when I started 15 years later um, at the Community College Association, um, all 28 of our community colleges had participated in Credit When It's Due and with Project Win Win, um, which were, you know, sort of foundational work that supported the Degrees When Due initiative that IHEP is leading now. Um, 
And I was really impressed with the outcome of those projects. Michigan colleges awarded over 2000 degrees to students um, who were eligible or um, had returned to complete their coursework. Um, and so when, when I have uh, shared this opportunity with us, I, I jumped at the chance um, to be part of the first cohort. And I'm glad I did because we ended up having 14 of our 28 community colleges participating in Degrees When Due um, over the first and second cohort. Um, I think part of the reason for that is obviously the excellent support that IHEP provides and also their coaches. Um, but also around this same time, um, Michigan, the governor of the state of Michigan introduced the idea of funding a free community college program for students who are age 25 and older, which we call Michigan Reconnect, uh, very similar to the Tennessee Reconnect that many of you are probably familiar with. So it seemed like perfect timing um, that colleges would be able to uh, leverage the fact that we have this really powerful message of free community college paired with students who have already uh, or chose to in the past go to community college and marrying those two things together is just a great opportunity for us to send a really strong and positive message to students about why they should re-enroll in community college. Um, I am so grateful to Kellogg Community College for sharing the great work that they've done with this project. And I'd like to introduce our speakers and then turn it over to them. Uh, Eric Green is the Vice President for Strategy, Relations, and Communications, and in his capacity of Vice President at Kellogg Community College, Eric implements strategic initiatives, builds institutional partnerships, and oversees the internal relations, external relations, and communications functions of the college. He previously served in the positions of Chief Communications Officer, Director of Public Information and Marketing, an adjunct instructor of journalism. Prior to joining KCC in 2012, Eric spent 19 years as a journalist working for newspapers in Michigan and Montana. I have used Eric's advice on traveling to Montana and strongly suggest uh, leveraging his expertise in that area as well. Um, Nikki Jewell serves as the Dean of Enrollment Services and Financial Aid. She is a first generation college student who began her career at Kellogg Community College in 1999, where she attended KCC as a non traditional student and began working as a part time secretary at an off campus location while attending. Several years later, she started working for the college's trio program where she found her passion working with underserved student populations. She later landed in financial aid and loved the impact that she was able to have on students including having difficult conversations in which she could help students navigate school and life. As the Dean of Enrollment Services, Nikki oversees the admissions and financial aid departments, as well as the operations of the Hub Enrollment Center, a self-service center for students. She became, uh, she believes that making con connections with students and their families matters, and that is what makes KCC. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric and Nikki. Well, thank you very much, Erica. It's great to see you again. And uh, thank you to everyone who is attending today's uh, webinar. It's great to see what 86 or so participants uh, really appreciate your interest in these topics. I also want to say thank you to IHEP for inviting us to share some of the things that we've been able to accomplish and learn along the way. Um, and definitely a, a big thank you to the Michigan Center for Student Success and the great work that Erica and her staff do for all of Michigan, including for those of us here in the Battle Creek area. Um, before we get into some of these strategies that we're going to talk about uh, regarding uh, connecting or reconnecting with our adult students, I wanted to give you a little bit of context and history for KCC so that you understand um, how our size and shape and structure might relate to yours. If you're like me, you've attended webinars and conferences and you sometimes hear from colleges that are a, a very different size, either much larger or much smaller than you. So I just wanna provide this context so you can interpret um, as you will. So KCC is based in Battle Creek, Michigan. That's in South Central Michigan. We serve about 8,000 students per year on our five campuses and online. 
We have a staff, a uh, regular full-time staff of around 260, but a total staff of about 900, and that includes adjuncts and part-time staff. And just to give you some, uh, some kind of apples to apples comparisons, um, our marketing department consists of five FTE, our admissions staff, which is under Nikki Jewell, is eight FTE, and our registrar staff is six uh, full-time positions. As I mentioned, our service area uh, is in South Central Michigan, and specifically that's three counties that we cover. We are an independently uh, governed college, meaning we have our publicly elected board of trustees that makes uh, decisions autonomously for KCC. We are not part of a statewide system, as many states are. And we're currently in the first year of our three-year strategic plan. Um, we, like many of you listening, uh, we have been riding the roller coaster of enrollment over the years. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we certainly were on the upswing during the course of the most recent recession. And then when that ended uh, and everyone was back to work, we uh, were riding the downslope of that. And our enrollment was gradually declining for years. And then also like many of you within the past 12 to 14 months, we've seen some pretty dramatic changes uh, toward the negative in our enrollment. But our current enrollment strategy in a big picture view is to build capacity uh, for growth areas such as our dual enrollment, which continues to rise, but also removing the barriers uh, and incentivizing potential growth areas such as the older adult population, which we're going to be talking about today uh, and which Leanne was talking about uh, so eloquently at the beginning. A little bit about our student population. Um, our fall semester typically uh, includes around uh, 4,500 or so students that are taking uh, classes for credit. About half of those are what we consider to be current returning, meaning that they've enrolled in at least one course in the previous three semesters. Now that means that uh, about half are either new or first time or are what we call prior returning, which means students who have been here at some point in the past, but uh, have not been here in the previous three semesters. Oftentimes that's defined as a, a stop out or, um, well, or as a stop out. We are, our student body is 69% white, 8% black or African American, um, and then uh, a mix of other races and ethnicities. We're about 60% female, our average age is 25 um, and our average student takes 7.2 credits per semester. So we are very much a part-time commuter campus uh, here in Battle Creek and uh, usually around 85 to 88 percent or so at any given time are receiving federal financial aid or Pell Grants. Uh, we are consistently ranked as one of the most affordable colleges in Michigan. Uh, and that's according to an annual survey that we do with all the other 28 community colleges. Um, and just for context, uh, the tuition and fees at KCC are about one quarter or 25% of the comparable tuition and fees at our uh, state universities here in Michigan. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're going to be talking about three specific campaigns or strategies that we have in place at KCC. Uh, all of which are designed to reach those uh, adult learners, many of which are the, um, the some college no degree audience that Leanne was talking about earlier. And that's going to be our Futures for Frontliners campaign, our Michigan Reconnect, which Erica was just talking about, and then the Degrees When Due. So I, I, I do want to say that Degrees When Due has that specific audience of some college no degree. Um, that that audience generally can apply to the other two campaigns as well, but I'll explain more and Nikki will explain more on how those are run internally. Uh, next slide. So we'll start with uh, Futures for Frontliners uh, and it is called Futures for Frontliners um, because the state of Michigan determined that the pandemic really took a toll economically on frontline staff and essential staff. Those were terms that a lot of us were using uh, quite regularly in the early and, and middle uh, parts of 2020. The state decided it wanted to offer free tuition to Michigan res residents who didn't yet have a college degree and who had worked in what they defined as an essential job during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we immediately saw the potential benefit to KCC because, of course, we want as much enrollment as we can get. 
So we declared ourselves to be a frontliners champion and we started developing a campaign. Now, initially the marketing questions, uh, the key questions for us was, does this apply to, th th does the benefit apply to new students or is it to existing and past students? And the answer is both. Uh, another key question, and Nikki will talk more about this, is what does free mean? Uh, you've heard the phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and uh, I'll let her reveal uh, some of the details of that. But free basically means that you get the resident rate tuition at your local community college if you apply to this program. And then thirdly, and importantly, is how is the state defining quote unquote essential jobs? And there's actually a very long list that the state put out. Uh, it's everything from chemical supply chain and communications to manufacturing, uh, defense industries, the energy sector, uh, of course, education, public health, law enforcement, and first responders. We hear a lot about those groups, uh, but also these other groups, right down to uh, if you worked in the water and wastewater industries, those were all considered essential. So it was a very large list, which was good for us because that meant that we had a, a larger uh, target audience to work with. The, yes, next slide, thank you. Um, there were certain eligibility requirements too. You of course had to be a resident of Michigan. You needed to have worked at least part-time for 11 of the 13 weeks in one of those essential industries. Uh, you had to have been required by your job to work outside the home during that period. So this was not for remote workers. And of course you had to have no degree uh, and not be in default on a federal student loan. And the kicker was uh, when this was announced in late summer um, by the state of Michigan, you actually had to apply for this benefit by December 31st of last year. So we actually uh, had to move very quickly um, to put this campaign together. Once we understood the program, the requirements, and of course the deadline, then we needed to understand our target audience. Next slide, please. Uh, our target audience, um, and if you're involved in marketing at all, you understand that that is where you start your campaign. You need to understand the people you're trying to reach. You need to figure out what motivates them, how they're going to become aware of what it is you're trying to tell them. And uh, what, is your, what is your ask? What are you gonna ask of them? The audience for this, um, for this campaign, as I previously described, some of the traits that are common uh, with people in this category, they're busy people. They tend to be older adults, like 25 and older. They have kids, they have jobs oftentimes, they have life demands, you know, they have health issues and ailing parents and they're involved in various things and they're trying to get their kids to soccer on time and all of the above. Uh, so for that group, the efficiency and convenience when it comes to their higher education, those are important factors, arguably even more so than uh, cost being a barrier. But that being said, We've always found that um, that that cost, even in perception, um, is an important um, is an important factor in getting people's attention for these campaigns. So I mentioned KCC is generally extremely affordable for most people, and when when people are thinking about college education, often one of the first things they do think is this is gonna be expensive and this is gonna be time consuming and I'm gonna end up saddled with a whole bunch of debt that I can't afford to, to have. Um, so for us and with that in mind, you see the sticky note on uh, the lower left of this particular slide. We use that image, uh, which specifically says free tuition uh, because we did believe, and it was proved correct, that anytime you can put free tuition, that is definitely going to get people's attention, uh, whether it's in, uh, in advertising or on social media. Um, and as you see listed here, our marketing strategy incorporated a number of platforms. Uh, certainly on the digital side, we used the KCC website, we used our news blog, we also plastered information all over Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But we also put print uh, advertisements in our local newspapers and a magazine. And we put out press releases, which actually generated some pretty good media coverage for us. And then the other thing that we did is Nikki and I, and I'll turn it over here her, to her in a second. We went on what we call the road show, uh, but it was virtual. And we put on a series of Zoom presentations for uh, just a variety of community groups, uh, sometimes in front of one group, sometimes in front of multiple groups at the same time. 
but they too had many essential workers in their midst or had connections to them. So I'm talking about college access networks and daycare centers uh, and uh, school districts who wanted to spread this message uh, to their audiences as well. And so what we did is we created partnerships with them to be able to take this message forward. They would then explain um, how, how the program worked and also put in a pitch for coming to KCC for that as well. Next slide. And then here's some examples of some of that advertising. These are just a few for Futures for Frontliners. You see on the left there, that's just the headline of our, our news blog. And once we had a press release published, we were able to use that in some cases repeatedly on social media and putting it out on Twitter multiple times. On the upper right is messaging about um, and this, this was a um, like a website banner ad, but we also had a print version. And it was speaking to those people who had been thinking about going back to college uh, and trying to instill in them and inspire them to believe that now is the right time, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic at that point. And on the lower right are a couple more examples. Um, <clears throat> you'll see uh, the one on the on the lower right, but in the background, that is program specific. So some of our messages were more about free tuition and come check us out. Uh, this particular one is specific to a program. In this case, it's one of our EMT options that we wanted people to enroll in. So you see that we incorporated this messaging into a variety of ongoing uh, uh, ads and campaigns that we had going forward. Nikki, do you wanna take it from here? Yes, thanks, Eric. So um, as you can, as Eric's explained, we are using this funnel method. So we worked, um, you know, him and his team worked on getting the message out there. Um, and then we took our, as he said, our show on the road, um, discussed in many places, you know, Michigan Works is a place that helps those who are unemployed. That was another big piece, you know, letting them know, um, answering questions. Um, and then the thing is, once we identified who those individuals were. So once we got to the actual part where individuals had applied for this program, that's when we started the one-on-one -on -one campaigns. That's when we started the outreach to those individuals. And during a normal time, that might look a little bit different. We might do some, um, you know, some, some mass campaigning to them, maybe just send them an email or a letter, but um, it was a little different this time. So we tried to adapt that in this holistic way of um, trying as many opportunities to reach out to students as we could. And so those who had um, applied to the state of Michigan, there were 1,097 students who were actually eligible for that future for frontliners. Um, that's pretty big considering that, you know, we just told you that we only um, serve about 5,000 students, you know, in any given uh, fall semester. The eligible, we had individuals that were eligible but did not apply to KCC. This was pretty important. That meant that of those 1,097 people who applied to the state of Michigan and said that they were interested in this, um, this scholarship program, only 42 of them originally did not apply to KCC. Right now we've got that number down to 27 because we have a strategy to get to them. So currently what I'm telling you is that we believe that what we did actually had an impact. What happened is those individuals, those 1,097 eligible individuals, what we did is um, we started in a strategic way to be able to first reach out to them, what we call the, the high to the boots on the ground of, um, approach. So first we sent them postcards. Hey, you know, we know that you've applied, you know, we're here for you, you know, here's our process, you know, let us know. Then from those individuals that we have, we automatically put scholarships on their account. If they had already applied to KCC, um, we went ahead and put those scholarships out there to incentivize them to actually come in to figure out what do we have to do next? Um, what we were looking at doing is from that postcard phase, we then looked at the geographic locations. We have three different centers, one of them in Barrie, one of them in Branch County, more rural um, areas. And we have staff at each of those centers. So what we did is we, divided up those individuals based on geographic location. And we had those center staff who have ties within that community many times know these students or their families making these phone calls to them individually. Hey, do you need help? We see you've got this scholarship. What do you, you know, here are your next steps to be able to get through to use this. Um, and those, those calls were very encouraging to us. 
Um, I know that we always hear that nobody wants to, to um, talk with anyone anymore, but we did get a, a very good feedback on that. In addition to that, um, the results were that for the spring semester, which was the first semester that they could actually use this scholarship and that we consider spring January through May, that we had 573 of them enroll. Of those 507, that's about 53% of the total that actually were eligible. So we were pretty happy with that number. Um, of those 58 of them were new students, 119 of them were stop outs and 396 of them were students who were actually here and continuing. And so what that did is that allowed students um, maybe some additional eligibility. Um, we know like our nursing program, although we know we are very affordable, but there, there are things that happen um, that they need additional assistance for. So the piece with this is that um, the free tuition piece it, it did become a little problematic once students got here, although we did explain that it was free tuition. We all know that there are expenses outside of the actual tuition piece that um, these students have. We then um, actually worked with, we have a, a kind of a network within the college, the KCC Foundation, in addition to the Center for Student Success. We all worked with wrapping ourselves around those students to say, okay, here's a student who can't afford books, what can we do? Um, so uh, we, we feel like we did a pretty good job with that. Now moving forward, we've got some good information, um, good results. We know um, what these students are needing. We just ran some numbers today because we um, were at the end of our semester. So of those students, uh, the 573 that enrolled, actually 54 of them are graduating for the spring semester. So we we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so those are kind of the, the, the pieces with the future for frontliners. Um, there were some stumblings that we found based on the, the free tuition piece. And now what we know is we need to tailor that message a little bit better because the one thing that we loved with those phone calls is we got direct feedback from students. What were the things that they were most confused about? What could we do to assist them through the process? And now how can we better communicate with students about this process going forward? So I am going to hand it back over to Eric regarding okay. the reconnect. Um, and, and Nikki, while you were speaking, we did get a question in the chat. Would you explain the free tuition in more detail? Could you just quickly uh, summarize what that free tuition means? Yes, free tuition. So it, it is a double-edged sword. It's a great marketing tool, um, and especially getting individuals in. Free tuition basically means that it is they get free in-district tuition um, in order to attend. So what that means is any student who lives outside um, of our service area or actually outside um, of our, our oh, what, what am I trying to say, uh, Eric? Tax district. Uh, our tax district, sorry, um, would actually have an additional amount that they would have to pay. But we all know when you're looking at building courses, you have lab fees, you have student service fees, maybe technology fees. So those fees were not actually included. Um, and I'm probably misspeaking because some of the fees were included if they were um, something that was attached to the actual tuition for all. But for instance, like a lab fee would not necessarily be included. So these students come in, um, you know, believing that this, this free, that they were just going to walk in the door and, you know, never have a care in the world. So it was our job really to make them understand um, that, yes, that this is, um, this is free in a sense, if you meet this criteria and what the essence of tuition actually meant. So there was some, some learning um, that was involved in that. All right. Well, let's move on and talk about the Michigan Reconnect program. This also was uh, authorized and announced and funded by the state of Michigan. Now, a little bit of um, chronology here. The state legislature and the governor had actually been talking about the creation of this Michigan Reconnect program prior to the pandemic. Uh, but just the way things uh, moved legislatively, it was the Futures for Frontliners program, which was created as a result of the pandemic, that actually came to fruition first and then um, actually early this calendar year is when Michigan Reconnect uh, really came into play for community colleges in Michigan. So just like Futures for Frontliners, we developed uh, a campaign for Michigan Reconnect in response to what the state had announced. There were actually similar eligibility requirements uh, as Futures for Frontliners, but this was connected more uh, directly to a broader statewide initiative to increase the percentage of Michiganders who have college degrees. 
That is called the 60 by 30. Governor Whitmer has been uh, promoting that since she took office. And that basically seeks to increase the percentage of working age adults with a skill certificate or a college degree to a total of 60% statewide by the year 2030. We're currently at 49%. So as a state, we're trying to move up 11 percentage points over the next uh, nine years. Next slide. So once again, um, before we started um, communicating and advertising and calling people with this opportunity, we needed to understand our target audience. And fortunately for us, uh, the audience was pretty similar to the Futures for Frontliners. So we had already done some of that work. We, and I should note that we have um, a pretty good ongoing understanding of our student population and our prospective students, which we um, have derived from focus groups and surveys. Uh, and of course, just anecdotal feedback uh, over the years. Uh, so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel in, in, in that regard. Uh, with the understanding of our target audience, which in this case, 25 and older, no degree, has to be a state resident. Uh, next slide. We once again declared ourselves a Michigan Reconnect champion, um, which it may sound a little bit funny. Um, you know, we didn't have to that's not a, a licensed program or anything. We just decided we're going to be a champion of this and we called ourselves that. Uh, but I bring that up because that actually helped us generate with this program uh, a little more um, media coverage, i.e. free publicity than we would have if we had not done that. And the way we did that is the state of Michigan announced um, the program. I want to say this was in early February. And we actually intentionally waited about a week or so later before we put out our own press release. And we basically put the headline out of saying that KCC has announced that we are participating in this new tuition-free degree program. Um, and that, the way that was framed and the way it was timed, uh, we actually had quite a few um, you know, uh, media mentions in our local media as well as regionally that we were participating in this free program. And of course, we did so on the basis that this is going to help individuals, it's going to help families pursue their dreams, it's going to help the state build a strong economy, it's going to help build a talented and modern workforce, and of course, KCC, um, with a long history of, uh, of working in that space, wants to be a, a big time player in that. Uh, whoops, can you go back one slide? So similar to Futures for Frontliners, uh, and, and you will see there are a lot of similarities between these two particular campaigns. Uh, we deployed assets digitally. We um, put advertisements in print. We, of course, got some publicity over this, and then we engaged, as Nikki will talk about, more direct outreach uh, to individuals who are potentially eligible. Now, one key difference with this campaign is there currently is no deadline for people to apply. This is a new ongoing campaign, unlike Futures for Frontliners, which did have that December 31 deadline. Um, and before I ask Nikki to um, kind of talk about our intake and our processing of Michigan Reconnect folks, I will say that if you uh, Google um, Michigan Reconnect and Michigan legislature right now, you will see that there's some pretty interesting uh, political conversations going on around these very programs. There are some who want them to continue. There are others who have proposed that they come to an end immediately. Um, and so we do think that the, uh, in, at the end, there'll be some, uh, some sort of compromise and that we do anticipate that they will continue in some form. So just to, obviously the Michigan Reconnect, now I do see there's a question um, in the chat and I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. Um, but the Michigan Reconnect is still pretty early. Um, we began being able to start um, pulling off from the state roster, which is like a web portal. The state of Michigan um, processes those and we're able to pull those um, student names off from. We, they began processing those in April. First set of applications can begin actually um, and using them in May for, so for Kellogg Community College, that's gonna be in the spring semester. Um, and currently we have 413 of those students that we have reached out to um, individually one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we are still in the development, um, looking at those numbers and how we can get them increased to actually have individuals apply to the state of Michigan. So that is, um, you know, obviously we're, we're in the mix of that still. So more to come on that. But to answer the question about what specific technology or software tools that we're utilizing um, in our process to re-engage and re-enroll stopout students, 
um, we really have, in addition to this, um, you know, this calling campaign that we had, um, one of the things that we have been using as well, Microsoft uh, 365, uh, Microsoft Teams has changed how we do everything um, in our office as far as um, how we communicate with each other, but also how we communicate with students. We were able to develop um, a text to students um, that were looking to enroll that we sent out um, with an actual Microsoft form in it. Um, and in that form, we asked them questions like, do you need assistance with this, this, and this? There were multiple things and they just had to click on what they wanted assistance with, fill out the form and submit it. And then Microsoft Flow was able to then generate um, and push that information to the specific department. So for instance, if they had a question regarding um, tutoring that you know they wanted it to get that set up and looking at that, that went to our academic um, success department. They had a question about advising, it shot to advising. So we we're trying to make it as easy as possible for individuals, because um, again, we know, um, you know, not everyone wants to pick up the phone and talk to someone. Um, but so we made that available. As far as um, during the, the whole pandemic, we have um, shifted all of our services, which I'm sure most everyone has, but online where we have a virtual services launch page that individuals can go to. We have live chat that um, individuals can um, get assistance with. So right now we're, we're still in the throes of um, making sure that we're utilizing all the technology we can in order to not just re-engage, but keep students engaged as well. Um, hopefully that answers the question, just, just an example. So again, as we're moving forward with Reconnect and our recruitment strategies, we actually have um, a meeting um, that we're putting together here um, next week, I believe, where we're talking about um, retention strategies now. So now that we're getting these students in, how do we keep them here? How do we keep them from, from stopping out again and not completing? So those retention strategies group um, is, is the next step in both of these populations and in, in to ensure that we're, we're understanding that they've got some unique needs based on the fact that that free tuition um, piece does sometimes leave students out there with bills and how are we going to handle that as an institution and what can we do as an institution to assist them. Uh, next slide please. Yeah and these are just some examples uh, of this campaign. On the left there again we have our uh, the announcement one of the announcements that we put out about this campaign on our news blog and then there's several examples to the right and in the middle uh, one is a handout, one is a print ad, one is a digital ad, and then we, we mix um, these up and use them in different ways over the course of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And I'm going to try to keep us to our, our time target here. I think we got about four or five minutes left and then uh, maybe there'll be some additional questions as well. But the, the third strategy that we want to talk about today, and I do say it's a strategy more so than it's a campaign, uh, because this is part of something that we are doing on a regular basis now, but that is our degrees when due uh, uh, strategy. And of course, you're familiar with that. Uh, Leanne described that at the top. It's part of our ongoing effort um, to help people who have earned college credits understand that they can actually get back on the pathway to economic and social prosperity. That's some of the language that we use. Uh, next slide. And so here again, we want to understand our target audience. In this case, it's past KCC students, really of any um, length of time in the past, uh, who do ha who have accumulated some credits but haven't yet claimed their degree. Um, we have been reaching out to these former students um, systematically, starting uh, in the late fall of of 2020. Um, we also know that in Michigan, there is actually more than a million working adults who have earned some college credit, but don't have a degree. And there again, that ties back to the statewide strategy of, uh, of increasing degree completion by the year 2030. Next slide. Our approaches for this do look different uh, from the previous two campaigns. And that is because this is an ongoing long-term I consider it really kind of a slow burn strategy because this is an audience that is much harder to define uh, because this involves students uh, from a variety of 
walks of life and also geographically, we don't always know where some of these students are these days and we're trying to re-engage them. In some cases, it may be a few semesters that we've been missing them. In some cases, it may be years. Uh, so we may not even have accurate contact information uh, on them anymore. However, we do go about um, once a semester, we identify a large group of those students that we believe we can contact. Uh, in late fall, that was about a thousand students that we did initially send a postcard to. And you see some of our strategies there. Um, we do have a digital component. This is not a targeted, you know, geolocational social campaign. This is more, uh, you know, high level awareness, almost trying to create um, digital word of mouth strategy. Uh, for example, we, we will put posts out on Facebook saying, do you or do you know someone uh, who might be able to benefit uh, from this degrees when due? And so we're trying to create uh, awareness that way. We're also sending these postcards directly to folks that we know might have an interest in this. And then we're also using our on-campus messaging, really a lot of one-to-one -one contacts, phone calls and emails, a lot of which comes out of our registrar's office. Next slide. Uh, every semester to try to reach those folks. Um, I, I don't know if Nikki has more information than I do, but of those uh, a thousand or almost a thousand that we had reached in uh, December of last year, we did have 37 of those who did re-enroll within a matter of weeks. So those are 37 students, it might not seem like a high number, uh, but you know, in, in our case, we will take every student we can, <laughs> especially in this time of uh, pretty unprecedented enrollment declines. And we, what we anticipate is that this might be, um, uh, we, we don't have historical data yet, but it might be that we can anticipate 30 to 40 or 50 students every semester going forward because we will continue to deploy this. And there again, here's a couple examples of some of the messaging that we used, such as the finish line it might be closer than you think. Um, we're seeking adults. There again, we're, we're targeting this message to adults. Um, and Nikki, do you have anything else to add here? And while you do that, I will look at the questions in the chat. Oh, you're muted. All my best stuff comes and I'm muted. Um, so as I went back and I kind of reviewed the chat a little bit, um, one of the things that I did want to say is one of the, the internal strategies that I think um, and I wanted to mention is I think that it's important to understand as an institution, when you're, you're doing this type of outreach and what your goal is, it's good to communicate that internally. Because for instance, in student services, we're, we're all in this. We're all trying to um, you know, get these students re-enrolled. So one of the things I would say is just last Friday, the, um, we met with the advising staff to talk about, hey, what are you guys hearing from like the future for frontliners that are currently here? What are some of the, the feedback there? What are the struggles that you're hearing from them? And so they were able to actually communicate with us some questions that they had um, to help be partners in uh, making sure that these students knew exactly how to utilize this benefit and what to look forward to. Um, so I think that part of this, and, and I would say the, the last piece of this is ensuring that everyone at your institution understands what it is you're trying to accomplish and having those regular communications amongst departments so that individuals know as well. Because the more people that know, um, the more likely it is that we can get that message out to the student. Um, so I see a question about... I think there's a question about, um, and I think Eric, you may have answered them. Um, yeah, Nikki, I was just trying to make use of our time here because I know yeah. it's really close. So I was You're trying good. to answer some of those questions. You're good, yes. Yeah, and, and I'll add for, for Bob asking about um, how you identify students who have not earned a degree elsewhere. That's the standard practice that, that we have recommended with all of our institutions through Degrees Window is that they um, check the list against the National Student Clearinghouse mm -hmm. um, to determine whether or not that student has completed um, a degree or a degree elsewhere. Yep. And I believe that is the end of our uh, prepared slides. I wanna turn it back to the uh, hosts and if there are any additional questions, we're certainly uh, here.
Thanks so much, Eric and Nikki. Really appreciate all the great content you're sharing. As a reminder, folks, please, if you have any questions for anyone throughout today's presentation, feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, Leanne's going to monitor some of those questions and ask them to the appropriate presenters. I think some questions are coming in now. So Leanne, I think, you know, Andres, here's an, um, Here's one from Natalie. Did you do degree audits up front or did you just reach out and see who responded? I believe that the degree audits were done up front to determine, um, you know, it wasn't just, oh, these, this person has 40 credits. I think that they, because we had to identify which, because they could have potentially been eligible for, um, you know, if they only had, you know, 48 credits, which degree would they be eligible for? So those degree audits were done through the registrar's office up, up front before they reached out. Excellent. And I know I, I had some questions for you about um, how you were able to find students, but I think you already answered those. Other than that, I just, um, you know, Tara, thanks for your note as well about um, NSC services in addition to the student tracker service. Um, we have another one. What size is the team that you have working on these projects? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, I think that's where we talk about this cross functionality. It really does take a village for everyone has to be on the same page. So Eric's, you know, and his team are putting that message out there. Um, but also internally making sure that we all understand what our roles are, because in order to get, you know, a, a student who has stopped out, we have to, to get them back in the door is, and to keep them takes everyone, takes advising, it takes the Center for Student Success, financial aid, admissions is involved in that. Um, you know, Eric's team gets them in, but we have to make sure that we still have the, um, you know, the supports in place to keep them here and get them through. Yeah, and that collaborative that Nikki's talking about, um, that's really three departments primarily, marketing, admissions, and financial aid. And to answer Nat Natalie's question, the size of those teams, uh, marketing is five people, registrars is eight, and admissions is six. Or did I get that the other way around? Admissions is eight, six, and then we have five in financial aid. There we go. Thank you for that. Now, keep in mind that this is not the only thing they're doing. This is one of, you know, a hundred things that they're all doing, just like all of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also, just to mention, we also do have um, a student retention product that we use. Um, and so we are looking at ways to be able to leverage that um, to assist, um, you know, getting these students to completion as well. So I think, um, I know that we, you touched on this earlier, but if we could reiterate, um, we had an attendee who's power went out and we're glad you were able to get back online and join us. Um, but how are you getting contact information for the formerly enrolled students? I know when we talked earlier this week, we figured this would be, um, this is always, always a question. Yeah, uh, I think um, from, from my understanding, what happened is they work with the, uh, the registrar's office, work with a third party for address verification. Cause what, what, we, what we didn't want to do is be sending out information so um, I, and I'm not in surely in, entirely sure who they used, but I know that they did take everyone that they had identified based on the degree audit, sent it to this third party verification to determine um, good if addresses were good to be able to use to outreach to them. So I do know that there are companies out there because yeah, when you're sending out, you know, um, a, a, a thousand to individuals and we knew that, you know, postage, you know, we understand it's not cheap. And so if you have a thousand of those, if you're only getting, you know, uh, a percentage of them returned, it's still, um, it's still a lot to be able to deal with. So that third party verification was um, important um, just to make sure that we were trying to, to actually get to those people. Yeah, and and I, will Erica, say, oh. I, I will say, Leanne, that is uh, the magic question is, is how do you find contact information for those folks? Uh, I see Erica put in the chat uh, that many colleges use Alumni Finder. We have recently started using that. Um, so if you can afford a platform like that, uh, it definitely uh, can help. Great, and I might be speaking out of turn, but Erica, I do remember um, conversations very early on in our first cohort of degrees when do a number of the uh, Michigan institutions were looking to see if there was a way that they could kind of somehow pull access to Alumni Finder to help share the burden of that cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I think, 
we have time for, I see one last question, I think, if you could speak about the student retention product that you mentioned. Um, we use Starfish. We have been using Starfish for several years. Um, you know, one of the things that we have looked at and talked about, and we're not there yet, is potentially even creating um, you know, a cohort based on these students, um, you know, to, to see because we have to track them. That's one of the things I didn't mention, the extensive reporting that goes along with these state programs. Um, and so we really are, um, we need to cohort them based on when they start. And then we have to make sure that we, um, we set a goal for completion of these students uh, and that we meet it. So there's some, um, there's some incentive involved in these programs as well. So um, but we're up to the challenge. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, I think that about gets us to the, the end of time. Um, just wanna thank all of you for joining us today, Nikki and Eric for sharing your expertise. We so greatly appreciate it. And um, I think you saw some comments also, at, at thanks for sharing the marketing materials. Um, I know that um, those are always just super helpful to, to see the examples of what other institutions have done. Um, and Erica, as always, thank you for your, your partnership and for helping to share some of the impact of Degrees When Due um, in Michigan, but also helping to, just helping to make the connection between these great programs um, that are, are offered and that, that have financial incentives for students to be able to return and helping to make that connection between the um, kind of financial incentives at the state level and what's going on at the institutional level so that we can really, really find the students and bring them back and help them to complete their degrees. For those of you, if you are interested um, in learning more, uh, please feel free to send us an email. Um, I think Andres will go ahead and put our um, email address back up in the chat again, or dwd at ihub.org. We will have a few more of these sessions coming up over the next few months. Uh, we're going to be really excited to share our um, degree, degree mining tool, which we're about ready to release, which is going to help institutions leverage their technology to um, identify earned credentials that already exist within their student data. And later on this summer, I believe, or in early fall, we'll also be able to share our degree reclamation playbook, uh, which is a, we're really excited about this. It's taken all of the learnings from, do, you know, the practical implementation steps from degrees when due and turning them into a, a resource for other institutions to be able to use. And we also have a kind of a mini series of degrees when due uh, workshops that we'll be offering over this summer for other institutions that might be interested in diving right in and implementing some of these targeted strategies to identify and re-engage their students who have stopped out before the fall semester. So stay tuned, um, look for our, we'll post it on our social channels at IHAP um, and definitely send us an email if you'd like to learn more. So with that, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you to Andres, my colleague, for his expert Zoom hosting and facilitation skills. Appreciate you. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.